Hi, Romina. Good morning, and thanks for joining. How are you? I'm good. Thank you for having me. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we're going to be talking today about uh, a recent paper that you guys put out uh, on the efficacy of propiconazole, which is a fungicide to control uh, lower wilt in avocado orchards. But before we dive into it, um, tell us a little bit about yourself. Where do you work and what's the focus of your lab? Sure. So thank you for having me again. Uh, my name is Romina Gassiz and I'm an associate professor with the University of Florida. I am based at the Tropical Research and Education Center. I'm the pathologist uh, in charge of any kind of diseases affecting tropical fruit trees and tropical and subtropical ornamentals. So I work with two big groups of plants. Um, I don't work with vegetables, but other than vegetables, I see everything. <laughs> um, I'm also the director of the plant clinic and the lead diagnostician. So my program really focuses on uh, diagnostics, understanding the biology of these diseases, either virus, bacteria, or fungi, and on management. Of course, all of that has to be extended to the clientele, um, regional, local, regional, and worldwide. Uh, so I do a lot of extension work as well, just to translate those knowledge into management and uh, practices that can be applied by growers. Nice, absolutely. Yeah, you've been there for a, a few years already, right? Like, when did you yes. start in, in South Florida? It, at the end of 2017, so it's going to be six years uh, in November, and I just got tenure, so awesome. I am now an associate professor. Thank you. Amazing, it's been a long amazing. road. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, just a little bit to, to start, tell us a little bit, what is lower wilt and what are the main impacts in terms of, you know, South Florida and the avocado growers that you see there? Sure. So, lower wilt is a fungal disease. It's a vascular disease and it's caused by an Ophiostomatelis, which is a group uh, of fungi. Um, and the name of the causal agent is Harringtonia lauricola. And it was previously called Rafaela lauricola, but it changed uh, name recently with good reasons. And so this uh, fungus is a nutritional symbiont of ambrosia beetles, in particular, and the original uh, vector of this disease and a partner in the beetle world is called Siloborus glabratus, or red bay ambrosia beetle. And um, this beetle nutritional symbiont is this Harringtonia lauricola. So they have a mutualistic relationship where the beetle carries the fungus in pockets, in this case, in the oral uh, pockets. And it carries this fungus because it cultivates this fungus. So it's also a farmer, just like the avocado growers. It also grows uh, their food. So they, uh, the female makes galleries and inoculates uh, the fungus while making those galleries. And so the brood and the offspring are going to be feeding on this fungus, not on the wood or not on the cambium of the tree, which is very important when we talk about management. Because since it's not feeding out of the plant, we cannot pump the plant with insecticides, right? Because they don't care. They are not eating the plant. Um, so this um, association, even though it's mutualistic for the beetle and the fungus, is not so good for the host. And so um, it causes a hypersensitive reaction if in naive hosts, which means that these are hosts that haven't been exposed to this beetle fungal system uh, for a long time. So whenever these beetle and fungus arrived and invaded, North America, more specifically the U.S., uh, it found a new host, right? They haven't been interacting. So the host didn't really know how to react to the infection. And um, what happens is that the beetle, while it's making these galleries and inoculating the fungus, the fungus escapes into the vascular system through the xylem. Mm -hmm. and it colonizes the host. And so the host elicits a very good defense mechanism. Um, it's called thylosis formation, and it also accumulates some phenols and gums. 
And this is a very good defense mechanism. It's widespread in, in, in hardwoods. If, we, if plants didn't have this mechanism, all trees will be decayed in no time, right? Because there's fungi everywhere. Um, and so it's a very good defense mechanism, very uh, primal mechanism. However, in American Laurasis, it seems that the fungus is able to uh, hide until it's too late and it's already systemic. So when the host realizes that it has the fungus in it, it's everywhere. So it starts making tylosis everywhere and cuts the subflow because this mechanism is its um, main objective is to prevent the colonization, the systemic colonization of the fungus. So it clogs the xylem, preventing anything to go through, including water. So it pretty much chokes itself. Yeah, it's it kind of like the, an allergic. Shuts down the system, yeah. Exactly. It's kind of like a hypersensitive um, allergic reaction of the host to the fungus. But we are just starting to understand what are the mechanisms of the host pathogen interaction at early stages. And that will be the key to really understand and try to find management solutions. Um, so we don't know why this fungus is able to overcome and hide in the first days of colonization versus what happens in Asia where this mm -hmm. beetle and fungus are native. Yeah, that's a very interesting point. Uh, you were saying, you know, this, this beetle is an invasive species, right? And when we talked about uh, ambrosia beetles in general, we typically hear about their secondary things that go after stressed trees, right? This is typically what we see when um, the tree is already declining, kind of like the, the, the later stages of uh, uh, the tree decline. But um, in this case, this is, you know, this is, doesn't go after stressed trees. This actually goes after every single um, species within the Laurasia family, right? We're talking about avocado, we're talking about red base, sassafras. Um, so it's not the typical ambrosia beetle that we most commonly hear about. This is an invasive species um, that it's, it's a primary pathogen, right? It's, it doesn't go after stress trees. Yeah, correct. So we have this um, knowledge that bark and ambrosia beetles go to stress trees. And the stress can be defined in many ways, right? Absolutely. It can be obviously stress, like you already have um, signs of drought or uh, a secondary or a primary fungal infection, and then these beetles come and finish the work, right? Um, but in this case, you are correct. Uh, the red bay ambrosia beetle goes after apparently healthy. I like to say apparently, because as a pathologist, I know that infected trees can be asymptomatic and um, to the eye of people. Right, uh, we will have to be measuring if they are secreting <laughs> some ethanol, or, but actually these beetles are not attracted to ethanol. So who knows where, <laughs> where they're yeah. attracted to? The, the, the bottom line is that they are um, infecting obviously, or perhaps uh, not obviously healthy trees. Um, and so to make things even worse, and I think in South Florida, what happened was the perfect storm right? Um, we were invaded by a beetle that goes after native trees in forested areas. Um, and not only that, but the fungus that was being carried by this beetle was able to laterally transfer to other local beetles, which are native or naturalized, which means that they have been here for a while. They may have not been here forever, but they are in populations that are established and they have multiple or a wide host of uh, range of hosts. So these are naturalized beetles, ambrosia beetles, and native beetles. So now not only one beetle is carrying this fungus, but other nine. And actually, the red bay ambrosia beetle doesn't like avocado. I have to say this is one of the few good things <laughs> that I can tell you about this disease, right? At least the main vector, which is carrying the most number of spores, or CFUs, which are colony-forming units, um, so the highest inoculum is found in this primary vector. And this one doesn't like avocado. If it had liked avocado, we probably wouldn't have any more avocado here. 
um, so now there's other nine beetles that are carrying the fungus either in their machangia and in their machangia and phoretically. So it's really the perfect storm, right? We have a very susceptible host uh, grow in small patches because we have a small acreage and it's mm. very divided. So we have plots of five, 10 acres. So it's, you know, very patchy distribution uh, surrounded by forest. So the, the inoculum was always present. And we have nine other beetles that do like avocado. <laughs> that so, is moving the um, around as well, yeah. Exactly. So we really had the perfect storm. I don't think it's going to be the same um, epidemics when it invades other places, mm -hmm. but it's not going to be good anyways, right? No, absolutely. Absolutely. We've seen a little bit of that um, here in eastern Texas. The impacts are more kind of like in native, you know, red bay, sassafras kind of trees. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, once once the beetle goes in, it introduces the pathogen. What are some of the signs, symptoms uh, of these um, this kind of like association that you, you see? Mm -hmm. Sure, so um, so first we have to understand that the alternative vectors are carrying small quantities of the inoculum. So the primary vector is carrying up to 6,000 conidia or um, inoculum. Mm -hmm. And so the alternative vectors are only carrying 150. So the initial inoculum is quite low in comparing to the main vector. Now, these beetles don't have to have a mass attack. Like if we are talking about PSHB or other kind of uh, beetle fungal disease systems, you usually see a mass attack and then you see the decline of the tree. This one, you can have one, one beetle building a gallery, one female, right? And so there's an incubation period, at least in avocado, of about 10 days. So okay. you have your first hit, right, of the tree. You okay. may or may not see frass. Um, if you see some frass, um, it may not be long lived because we have a lot of rain, right? Mm -hmm. So it gets washed off really quickly. You will see the very tiny entrance hole. And avocado uh, reacts to any kind of damage with the secretion of sugars. So you may see all those sugar volcanoes, uh, very typical of avocado, but you may not because it may rain. Um, and so then after this 10 days, 10 to 14 days incubation period, you're gonna start seeing some wilting. Again, this is a vascular pathogen that elicits a blockage of the xylem. So you will see some of these drought symptoms. Now Which is pretty the fast. symptoms. Uh, I mean, ten days is pretty fast. Okay. It is. It is fast. So you will see the first signs of wilting in the branch where the beetle uh, made the first entrance, right? Mm -hmm. And then you will see what we call green wilting, which is perfectly green, beautiful growth, but starting the petiole starting to bend. Okay. Now that's. You know, and it's kind of on the clock, actually. So 10 to 14 days, and then very quickly, 20 days, 25 days, you start seeing desiccation and branch dieback. And then um, one of the characteristics of this disease is that the drying happens so quickly that the leaves remain attached to the branches. In comparison to Phytophthora and other uh, perhaps root diseases that mm. also cause the um, compromising the root system and preventing them to uptake water, those are more slow so that the leaves uh, It's kind of like the same symptom, but over time, it's like a slower yeah, process. Yeah, exactly. Basically. So then um, suddenly, like in a month, a month and a half, you can lose the entire tree. And we are talking okay. about you know, 40 year old tree, 50 yeah. year old tree, the entire canopy is gonna be all dried. And this could have been because of one entrance, one inoculation by the beetle. Now, sometimes when there are a lot of beetles around, then you will have mass attacks and mm -hmm. the tree goes really quickly on those cases, right? So, so faster than even 40 though, days, basically. Yes, exactly. So we don't see a lot of mass attacks, but they do happen. 
Um, and so those are the external symptoms. So very quickly, drought symptoms, I will describe them very, very quickly. Um, on, on, on every host, right? Like, so it doesn't matter if it's an avocado or a red bay. Um, that is typically true. Typically, it's going to take a month and a half. Okay. That is true. Now, once you open the tree, so let's say that you are wandering at maybe 14 days. You say, 14 days, you know, what is this wilting? Then you take out the bark, which the good thing on Laurasis is quite simple. Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, I have tried to peel walnuts and... It's not that simple. So the bark comes up really um, fast and easy. And usually avocado has a creamy white subwood uh, mm -hmm. color. Now, the ones that are infected, you will see a bluish, dark, brown, black streaking. That streaking is the dead vascular system. And you can see it before you see the brown wilting. So once you see the wilting, the green wilting, it's already damaged internally. So those are the symptoms. Uh, and then the other thing very important in avocado orchards is that the fungus can transfer uh, through the root grafts. And you know, we, we are planting trees very close to each other. And avocado has a, a very superficial root system mm -hmm. and it expands quite a bit from the base of the tree. On top of that, and that's what I refer to the perfect storm, uh, in South Florida we have rock as a substrate. So there's they don't go very deep, right? So really um, roots go laterally and then they meet with their neighbor and form this root graft um, where the vascular system is connected to adjacent trees. So mm. the fungus can pass to the next tree in a matter of a month. Gotcha. So once you see the symptoms in a tree, even the early symptoms, you should take, and we're gonna talk about management, but mm -hmm. most likely the adjacent trees are already infected. Yeah, and I'm got, I was gonna ask exactly about that because you know, um, without getting into the chemical treatments that we can use, um, what are some of the practices that growers kind of like do and use to, you know, manage this disease um, in terms of like cultural practices? Yeah, so there has been a lot of work, um, grower initiated actually. Uh, growers mm -hmm. are very active and they're always trying to find solutions. Um, the disease arrived to the avocado producing area in 2012, but we knew it was coming. Mm. Right, and this was before my time, but uh, <laughs> I know my colleagues were tracking the spread of the disease from uh -huh. Georgia into Florida into Miami area, and so they were already experimenting uh, in the areas where the disease was already present. Mm -hmm. So, uh, things that people have tried are stamping the trees with the hope that since this is a vascular system, the canopy, uh, when the tree doesn't have canopy, there's not gonna be transpiration. So you kind of stop the movement of the pathogen, right? That was one of the hopes. Um, they have tried stamping and solarizing the stump using bags. So mm -hmm. when I just arrived here in 2017, this was still a practice and you will drive around and you will see this ghost looking trees because yeah. they were covered with a white bag. I don't know if you have seen them. Yeah, yeah, I've um, seen that. Very eerie. Um, and so they were covering these uh, stamps with the hope that the heat was gonna kill the fungus because this fungus is not thermophilic. So mm -hmm. it stops growing, I wanna say at 32 um, Celsius. And um, so it doesn't like the heat, so it stops growing, it doesn't die and I have done the research, it does not die. It just comes back mm -hmm. uh, once the temperature uh, goes down. So they were trying to do that. Uh, of course, there were several issues with that because the fungus is in the root system and the soil acts as a buffer for temperature. So the roots are not gonna reach the temperature of the stump. Um, however, the stump does reach the temperatures that we are looking for to kill the fungus, but mm. still the wood acts as a, as a buffer, right? 
and, and it acts as a fungistatic high temperatures, not as a fungicidal, so it does not kill the fungus. Other things, people try to so cut it, the so branch. It like keeps, so it like keeps moving through the root system, basically, even if you do that kind of stuff. Through the root system, yes. In the stump, it perhaps may stop its growth, but it doesn't kill it. Yeah. The only good thing that the stumping and bagging did is if there were galleries inside the tree, just by heating up, probably you will kill the larvae. Um, mm -hmm and the beetles cannot escape because there is a bag. Yeah. So, you know, not really, but it helped a little bit, I guess. Um, so people were also cutting the branches as soon as they saw the obvious symptoms. And remember, obvious symptoms for me and you will be different than for a grower. Yeah, absolutely. Right? Um, and we are talking about hundreds of trees that people have to scout. So obvious symptoms are already too late symptoms, really, for the growers. Um, other things that they have tried is uh, there was an idea of trenching. Mm -hmm. So that means cutting uh, the root systems in between the root grafts, so preventing the root grafts in between adjacent trees, which is a good idea because it was going to cut one of the pathways of transmission, mm -hmm. which is extremely important in orchards. So even though we do get heat quite a bit by the beetles, the most important way of transmission is through root grafts. It's just like a wildfire. So that's a good idea, perhaps in other systems, but in Florida, because we have rock, they mm. have to bring heavy equipment with large blades, and it is, I've seen it, I have videos, it's scary. Uh, yeah, we expensive. use that for, for oak wilt here. Uh, because it's kind of like one of the best approaches to exactly. you know, remove those root grafts between live oaks. Exactly. But here it's just not viable. Uh, they have tried, let's see. I imagine removal mm -hmm. of the trees and, you know, like destroying that wood actually yeah. helps in those cases. I, f I feel like that's something that they might um, do as well, right? Yeah, so I was going to go through the ones that didn't work, but now the mm. ones oh, that okay, work. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. <laughs> so the ones that work are. Um, removal of the tree completely Remove. with the root system up. Okay. Um, this is a vascular pathogen. It does not survive on the soil. That's mm. the second good thing about this disease. There are other vascular diseases like a mango that actually the pro propagule can survive in the soil. This mm -hmm. doesn't survive. Uh, so you have to remove the tree entirely. We recommend to remove the adjacent trees as well uh, as a precaution. And um, now the, the growers have really found ways of removing the tree more efficiently. At the mm -hmm. beginning, I think it was maybe $160 to remove a tree. Now okay. it's like 50 or less. Okay. Um, so they have, um, that's a good thing. You know, the industry is working towards cheaper uh, ways of removing trees. And you have to chip the tree, right? And And by chipping the tree, you will dry up the fungus because it will be exposed, and also you will cut those galleries, and so mm. there was not more brood um, to be produced on those logs. Now, I have seen people cutting the tree to the stump and then leaving the logs next to it. So that's just a factory of beetles, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, then the other thing that works is to reduce the canopy. Okay. And so what I mean is increasing light because these are forest um, beetles, right? They like the forest type of habitat. So they don't really like light. And they fly during dusk, and so they like shadow, right, or, or shade. So um, increasing light has worked to reduce beetle population. Mm. And it's also good because we have hurricanes. So we have always been recommending to the growers to keep the trees low. Um, that's a that's another difference between tropical avocados or West Indies Guatemalan avocados versus Haas and Mexican mm. um, commercial Mexican varieties, uh, which are smaller trees, and the canopy is not as big as the ones that we have here. Again, perfect storm, right? Yeah. Big old trees with huge canopies, um, and so growers used to have. Their trees, you know, we have to use those 
trucks with those elevators to harvest the yeah. avocados. While in Haas, there's a person walking, picking up the Haas with a hand. Um, so there has been research showing that increasing light helps uh, reducing the hits on orchards. By so is that for beetles. both the, the primary vector, so the red bay ambrosia beetle, Correct. and the other insects that might be moving the spores as well? So like in ambrosia beetles in general in this order. In general, yes. Actually, as I mentioned before, the red bay ambrosia beetle is almost Very never found to, yeah, okay. yeah, on, on, on avocado orchards. Hmm. Yeah. Interesting. So when you were talking about removing the trees, uh, you know, chipping the wood and all of that, is it common to also kind of like remove a buffer of other trees that might be, you know, maybe the, the fungus move through the, through the root system or maybe they're showing symptoms but you haven't really seen it yet? What, what is the common practice or just removing that single tree? So it's, it's yes and no and everything in between. Okay. So <laughs> we definitely encourage the growers to remove the adjacent trees because we have um, done some research and, and, you know, this is such a complex um, disease system that me telling you I have seen this, it, it's really dependent on the context. So I have tried this variety with this tree architecture, with this uh, age, and, you know, because the vascular disease tree architecture is very important. How many branches, how big is the tree, the diameter, and so on. But we have um, found out that once you see the first symptoms, so that's 10 days after mm -hmm. inoculation, and this is artificial inoculation. Um, so 10 days after you inoculate a tree, and you see the first um, green wilting, one week after that observation, the pathogen is already in the root system. Oh, okay. So basically 20 so, days. Yeah. So we really encourage people to do it. We have growers that systematically remove adjacent trees. Got and they are still in production. And these are the people that make more profit. Hmm. Because, yes, you're going to lose a tree, but you're going to really break the chain and the outbreak. So it's just going to be good in the long term. But I completely understand that telling somebody to remove a healthy looking tree is hard, right? It's hard. No, absolutely. It's something that we see all the time with, uh, you know, bark beetle management in general as well. Um, it's, uh, it's an interesting concept, but, you know, it, it kind of works for, for some species where it's been shown that actually makes a, an effect for sure. Yeah. And another thing that is part of the perfect storm is that you have to pay to remove the tree, mm. right? So let's say that you pay a hundred bucks or 80 bucks or whatever. Um, the tree itself is not, it doesn't worth a lot, especially mm. the green skin avocados in comparing to Haas because the green skin avocados are cheaper, way yeah. cheaper than a Haas. So, you know, at the end it's about profit, at the end it's about, Absolutely. you know, um, so, trying to reconcile uh, long-term profit versus month to month um, is definitely a challenge, but we mm. do have a good relationship with growers and I think now um, more people are um, going into sanitation. Yeah, that's good, that's good. Um, so, you know, you, you've done some experiments with propiconosol, this, this chemical, this fungicide, that um, there's been multiple papers before this one dealing with different aspects uh, and maybe different hosts. So, um, you know, you, you did some uh, experiments with like potted trees and injecting trees and stuff like that. But before getting into that, what do we know about propiconosol and their efficacy in, um, you know, not only avocado, but other laracia, right? There's been some tests in uh, Red Bay and, and other hosts. So what do we know before, like, how do we, how do we get to this point where we're testing what we're yeah. testing? Yes, so it's a long story, yeah. right, about <laughs> propiconazol, because as I told you, my colleagues were waiting for the disease to arrive, right? So there was a little mm -hmm. bit of time to prepare for it. Yeah. Uh, not enough, but there was some time. So uh, my predecessor, Randy Plotz, did a lot of work on testing different uh, frac groups, so different mode of actions. You know, mm -hmm. fungicides have different mode of actions. They interfere with different processes on fungi to avoid their growth or to kill mm -hmm. them. 
So uh, because there was some literature, actually pretty good literature about um, the um, effectiveness of triazoles towards Ophius um, mm-hmm. You have Dutch elm disease, you have oak wilt. There are several vascular diseases uh, that have been treated with propiconazole and other triazoles. So even though he tried several other mode of actions, this one was the one that worked, triazole. And there was two compounds, propiconazole and, um, is it tetraconazole? I think, um, yeah, I think it's tetraconazole, the one that also was good. So, um, yeah, so there was literature on that. They did in vitro. First, you do the in vitro to see if the best case scenario, you put the fungus next to the active ingredient, right? If it doesn't work there, it's not going to work in the tree. It's not going to work inside the tree unless you're testing some kind of uh, systemic acquired resistant type of molecule. Mm-hmm. Okay, so for propiconazole, it was established in. Um, for this fungus, uh, which is the same as the one that affects uh, red base and sassafras. And the good thing, the other good thing about this disease is that genetic studies have shown that there is only one introduction. And so it's one big clonal population. Um, I'm gonna go into that research soon because you know it has jumped too many vectors. It has jumped too mm. many hosts. I wonder if it's changing. But so far, what we know is one big clonal population, which is advantageous for research because we don't have to test different strains. When we talk about other pathogens, we really have to test a broad range of strains because some of them are more virulent than others. Yeah, there's a lot of diversity. In this case, the good thing is that we have one big group, so we can just use one strain and we're Mm -hmm. good. So there were some thresholds uh, being established. So propiconazole is fungistatic at 0.01, um, 0.01, no, 0.1, sorry, 0.1 ppm parts per million. That means that it's gonna stop 100% the growth of the fungus. Okay. So this this molecule, what it does is prevents the generation of a cell wall. So that means that it's not fungicidal, but fungistatic, right? Um, if you go up to one ppm, it kills the fungus. Gotcha. So at least you need one ppm in contact with the fungus to kill it. So because of the research on sassafra, um, I'm sorry, on red bay and swamp bays. Uh, we thought this was the best option, right? Now, Mm -hmm. something to consider when we compare forest species and urban trees is that we are not eating their fruits, right? Well, maybe squirrels eat the the oaks, but... um, So we have to be considerate that the product cannot accumulate in the fruit. And not only the product, but the formulation. So when you read a label, it says active ingredient 42%, X ingredient 60%, right? That inert co- uh, compound, which is usually proprietary of the mm-hmm. brand, may accumulate in the fruit, and EPA and FDA and you name it, it's not gonna wanna use it. So when we compare, we need to be uh, conscious that we need to have something that does not accumulate in the fruit and um, that it actually has zero disease, right? When you read these papers, you will see that some of them say, okay, we think this is efficacious. There's only 50% of crown wilt in. Yeah. That's not good for production, right? It may be good. I don't know. Somebody want to have it in the backyard. I want to keep it alive yeah. because your grandmother planted there. Yeah. Okay. But when we are talking about avocado production, we have to have yield. So every branch needs to be productive Mm -hmm. and we need to have quality. So a very winky, you know, a very just uh, declining tree is just not going to produce high quality, high yielding avocado. So we really uh, need zero (laughs) 
yeah. zero uh, disease symptoms, right? So certain methods, let's say injection of you know propiconazole that has kind of like worked for red base, not necessarily the same process to approve it for avocados, basically. Completely, and of course, red base and sassafras and other of these forest species have the challenge of even being able to use any product in the mm -hmm. forest. Yeah, absolutely. We don't do that kind of management, right? Yeah. Uh, high value trees in a germplasm collection, in a, in a botanical garden, or somebody with money that wants to keep their tree alive, um, perhaps it will be okay uh, because you can use this arbor jet, uh, Alamo, all of these formulations that do have these other compounds that make mm -hmm. it more soluble and silent mobile, uh, which we can't use in avocado. I mean, they told us, no, you cannot use any of these arborist uh, tools. Mm. There may be a different story there, right? Also the way of applying, if you have one value tree, uh, you can do macro infusion, you can spend all this money and labor in uh, pumping that tree full of uh, fungicide and, and the story may be different. So, yeah, because, that, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, so even though there were many studies that had supported the use of fungicides, they are context dependent. And mm -hmm. you really have to think about uh, the avocado production system. And, you know, even though we use a lot of this data, not it doesn't work for our system. Gotcha. If that makes yeah. sense. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So, you know, things like uh, macro infusion of propiconazole that, you know, has been shown to work for certain Laurasia, right? The uh, Adapting that to the avocado growers is a completely different story. Yeah. And that's where kind of like your paper comes in, right? Um, you guys looked at soil drench and other types of injection. So can you briefly describe uh, what you guys found with this? Yes. So before I, I tell you about the paper, so I've been here for almost six years mm -hmm. and I took over uh, Randy Plot's program maybe four and a half years ago. Mm -hmm. And the first thing that I had to face was this notion of injections working and mm. propiconazole working. Um, tilt, which is the formulation that is used as, a, as an injection, is mm -hmm. actually a foliar fungicide. It's a foliar formulation. Mm. And, you know, if you think about it, foliar formulations are, are made to be sticky and oily because you want them to stay on the leaves. Mm -hmm. And they translocate a little bit, it's a little mobile, but is made for foliar applications. Growers were so desperate, right, to find something that they can use and completely understandable. And uh, because of the other research in the other species and because the in vitro research and because these multiple studies on potted plants on just few trees in the landscape, some of which were not actually challenged mm. with the fungus. They were just uh, relying on natural inoculation. And as a scientist, you know, we like replications. <laughs> we like to inoculate trees so we know they are being yeah, challenged. Absolutely. You know, that maybe, I don't know, there was some current going on on that plot that did not allow the beetles to land on that tree. So, you know, we want to be systematically and we want to be able to recommend something that we believe in. Mm -hmm. And so I really spend a lot of resources, time and effort, trying to convince growers that we need something else. Mm -hmm. Especially because if something is labeled, either we are not gonna get more support from the, from the industry or from grants because, hey, you already have something. Why are you asking for more? And other producing areas such as California or Mexico or Central America, they're gonna say, oh, when it comes here, we can inject the trees with propiconazole. And I know, I knew <laughs> that it's not gonna work, right? Because I have seen injected trees dying, but I didn't have any data systematically collected to show them to show and them. to be able to go and ask for grants to look for other options. So this is how I started this project. Um, mm -hmm. 
I have been trying to collect data through the years to show the growers and I decided, you know what, let's just go for it, do this testing and get get over with, Good. right? So I partnered with a horticulturist, which is the one who is the one that takes care of the plots here at mm -hmm. Trek. And I was able to find a, a you know, good size plot to test, more than 70 trees. Now, nobody gives you 70 <laughs> avocado producing 15 year old trees just like Absolutely. that. Right? Absolutely. Right? So he was as desperate as I was to, <laughs> to show the growers. <laughs> So, okay, so going back, we started with the potted trees, right? Uh -huh. So there was some research previously done with drenching, and uh, results were not really clear. It seemed like sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't. And so I said, let's just do it, because we, f we need to find a drenchable option. Yeah, nobody absolutely. wants to inject, nobody wants to do macroinfusion either foliar application, which is less, less likely to move into the wood. Mm -hmm. um, drench application will be ideal. Even soil injections will be okay. So we started with the potted trees. Um, one thing that we did was to be sure to have a clean, healthy root system. So they are ready to update everything, yeah. right? So we we're sure that it's a healthy root system. We treat them with Ritomil, which is a different action, mode of action fungicide mm -hmm. that only affects all my seeds, like Phytophthora root rot. Um, so we, you know, we drench the trees. Uh, we had a randomized design, everything mm -hmm. okay. Um, we use 1X, 2X, and 4X, which means that uh, label rate twice and four times. And we did it in two applications with two weeks in between, giving all the perfect conditions for this potted tree to absorb the compound. Then we um, inoculate the plants with a pathogen and uh, it was perfect. So all the control ones die mm -hmm. at two weeks, clock, you know, as, as we already expected. As usual, as expected. As usual. And then the ones that we drench, perfectly healthy. So we got excited. We opened the trees. We look at the internal damage, no internal damage. We plated the, the tissue, no recovery. And another thing that we did in this study, which is the bottleneck for every fungicide testing is the residue analysis. Mm. Residue analysis is very important because then you know how much PPM has been absorbed by the plant, but it's also extremely expensive. So it's around $200 per sample. Mm. So if you have replicates, if you have yeah. multiple sites, then your budget really yeah, yeah. you know explodes. Okay, well, yeah. So we did, you know, we did the, the the residue testing and the plants had acquired um, levels above the fungicidal threshold. So mm. they had two, four, five PPMs. So number one, we prove that propiconazole as a tilt can be absorbed by the root system and mobilized into the subwood. We prove that that amount is enough to prevent uh, the fungus to colonize a tissue and to induce disease. Right, so okay. we were like, oh my God, <laughs> so happy, this is gonna work. You know, why they didn't do it before? Little that, <laughs> that we knew, um, things were different in the field, right? Mm. So we did the same in the field. We um, clean the roots, treat the roots with the fungicide so they're healthy. Mm -hmm. um, trees were looking healthy, beautiful, good root system. We drenched twice. And we drench really carefully around the root system of the avocado, so it absorbs uh, good. We tested PPM uh, concentration before we did the inoculations, and we tested root flares, trunk, and secondary branches, which mm -hmm. is something different than other previous studies on urban trees and forest trees also. They test the main stem which is the place where the red bay and brochure beetle goes. Yeah. But the secondary branches is where these other beetles come. 
So getting the product there is also important. So values were low, but if you think about it, we are drenching a big tree, yeah. but they were above the fungistatic threshold. So they were gotcha. above uh, the 100% inhibition. Okay, we were ready to inoculate. We inoculated and it was devastating to see two weeks after all treatments having trees showing symptoms. So it was a very sad day for us mm. because we put in 70 trees. Yeah. And um, it was rough. So as the time progressed, uh, more trees were getting sick. Mm. And more importantly, um, the disease was moving into non-inoculated branches. Mm, gotcha. So another thing that we did is we cut the branch once we saw obvious symptoms. If we were a grower, let's see, okay, so maybe we cannot prevent disease, but maybe it will slow down enough that growers can go and cut the branch. Yeah. And so we did that. We cut the branch once we saw obvious symptoms, not pathologist obvious, grower yeah. obvious, right? And we consulted with growers. Um, that did not work either. So it had already moved into the non-inoculated branches. Is that so, about the distribution of the chemical or is that about just how it's been moving upwards? Correct. So it is moving not only small quantities when you drench, mm. but it's also moving it very heterogeneous. And if you think about it, this is an old hardwood tree. The vascular system is quite complex, right? You have decay, you have compartmentalization, Absolutely, yeah. you have a lot of things going on. So it's very patchy. So those areas where you don't have the fungicide, the fungus can go in. Also, the fungus can move through xylem layers, not mm. only the active one, but we have found that it can go deep, deep into the wood, uh, deep into the wood where you think there is no active xylem, but there's stuff moving around on those vessels. So the fungus is very sneaky and, and it can really move around. Mm. So that didn't work. Um, yeah, so pretty much the trench yeah. didn't work. <laughs> um, on top of that, we stumped the trees and then we thought, okay, so it does not prevent infection. It does not prevent multiplication. It does not prevent mobilization. Maybe the stumps get enough because it's at the base, right? And mm -hmm. that's where the most accumulation happens. Um, maybe people can regraft those stumps and use them for later, because then mm. you will be saving at least three, four years of production. You know, if you just graft yeah. a new yeah. um, scion on the rootstock. So it did not work either. So we opened the stumps and you could see the staining inside of the stumps. And the re-sprouts, we let it re-sprout because that's one of the misconceptions that growers have because these stumps are able to create another xylem layer because they don't mm. have a canopy, right? So they put all the effort in um, like below canopy growth. So they really get thick and they put mm -hmm. another xylem layer very quickly. And we are in the tropics, right? Plants grow 24-7. Yeah. <laughs> so they make quickly another xylem layer and they can re-sprout. This clean green re-sprout is sucking water through this new xylem. And so growers are like, hey, I can work with this, right? And this is one of the reasons we had a lot of stumping and it's still happening mm. and growers still fight with me about <laughs> the uh, health status of these stump and re sprouts. And so we let it run. We let the, the sprouts uh, grow and most of them eventually collapse with the disease because the fungus can move from the infected old layer into the new layer and then is sucked in or up those re sprouts. So stumps do not. not an option not an option. Also, yeah. as a pathologist, leaving an infected plant material is a no-no, yeah. <laughs> right? Um, Absolutely. Yeah, so Absolutely. it was pretty rough. Nothing yeah. worked on the drench uh, plot. So, 
in terms of like the injection, like what type of injection do you guys try and mm -hmm. what were like the results there? Okay, so we were pretty sad because this one didn't work, right? <laughs> and we were happy that we have a partner in the industry, it's called Brooks Tropical. Um, it's one of the biggest avocado uh, growth services and producers. And so they donated 10 trees. Okay. Again, these are very difficult to find. Uh, trees that had been injected five times mm -hmm. um, through the years, sometimes every 12 months, sometimes 18 months, sometimes two years. Now, we can't control this. Unless we start now injecting and maybe five years from now I can start my experiment, we just have to go with whatever they have. Mm -hmm. So we got these trees. They are, were from the same variety, the same age, in the same plot, treated exactly the same. So that was uniform. So we went in and we measured PPM in okay. the secondary branches all over the place. Some of them had 0, 0.0 something or point something, and some mm -hmm. other had 200 PPM. So number one, injections are <laughs> do not distribute the product homogeneously. Was this right. what type of injection are we talking about here? This is a micro injection. Okay, so it's injection. basically just a plug into the uh, cambium layer, um, and then literally use an injection. Perfect. Um, and so we tilt uh, with the rate on the label, and um, so. The distribution was not homogeneous, but we went ahead and we inoculated the trees. And what we did is, uh, this is a secondary branch, and we mm -hmm. measured the PPM here and we inoculate here. Okay. So we were as close as we could be on the amount of PPM where we do the inoculations. Now, these inoculations were the same as in the drench plot. Uh, we kind of imitate what a beetle will do, right? We did um, six holes and we only put 18,000 um, conidia, so way lower than the greenhouse uh, experiments, just to, you know. Yeah, imitate like the imitate, natural process of colonization, exactly. basically, yeah. Okay, so everything was good. We did it. And two weeks after, again, we saw disease. So um, doesn't matter. There was no correlation with um, the amount of propiconazole. Now the symptoms develop slower in comparison to the drench and in comparison to non-treated trees. Mm -hmm. uh, definitely is that is doing something, but it's not enough, right? It's slowing down the the multiplication of the fungus, and then it also went in most of the trees to the non-inoculated uh, branch. So mm. it, it does not prevent the movement. It slows down. And this is what is confusing growers, right? Because when I talk to growers, they say, I'm still gonna do it. Because, you know, when you compare a non-injected plot with an injected plot, we we um, have to take out less trees in the one that is injected. Mm. That's their observation, right? Per month, 10 trees in the non-injected, five trees in the injected, let's say. Okay, I buy it. It's actually a correct observation because what they are doing is slowing down, right? So it makes sense. If you slow down the process, you have less trees that you have to remove. Yeah. However, the fungus is in the roots, just it's a time bomb, right? So when the PPM goes down, because also propiconazole, and it has been shown in the other species of Persea and relatives, and in the other systems, you have to reapply at least every 12 months. Like at the seven month, you already see decay of the product. Mm. So okay. it will go down, right? especially with this heat, it will go down. So, so once, let's say they, that the grower is trying to stretch uh, the applications, it's a time bomb for the fungus to spread everywhere. So um, it does slow down the, the, 
the movement of the of the fungus, but it does not prevent colonization, it does not prevent multiplication, it does not prevent uh, moving into the main stem and into the other branches. Do you think this is because of the type of injection? Like, you know, if you compare to the macro infusion, um, even if, you know, pr um, avocado orchards or producers cannot use the macro infusion system, um, it does kind of like work when you compare to the micro injection. So it, you think it's about like, how it distributes uh, in the tree, or what? Why, why some of these uh, methods are more like effective than the others? Yeah, I agree. So definitely, macro infusion uses a lot more volume, so it has more uh, media into which carry the product, right? Mm -hmm. And it's a lo slow process, so you just let the tree kind of suck it up and and through transpiration pull that. Um, active ingredient in. Mm -hmm. Propiconazole is notorious for not moving laterally too much. It goes up and down, right? Um, so there is an inherent um, challenge there. However, macro infusion puts more volume, slower process. It's in the root flare, so definitely better than starting up in the top. So I would think, um, and there's some evidence that suggests that this will be a better option, um, but still the challenge of propiconazole and the formulation of tilt not being silent mobile enough. Yeah, so basically it's a combination of cost and the way the product is that it's not gonna move like homogeneously across the tree basically. Do you think that, you know, I, I imagine that you guys face also, um, you know, people that have either avocado trees or other laracea on their gardens, right? Like in the urban setting. So do you guys recommend this kind of approach, this kind of method for uh, ornamentals or it, you guys like stay more with like the producer kind of uh, side of things? Yeah, we, we do focus on avocado growers, uh, mm -hmm. but I do have a soft, soft spot for forest species. <laughs> so I do care about sassafras. I mean, it's such a ecologically important uh, tree and just gorgeous. Um, mm. So I do try to help uh, people that have these uh, trees. Now, again, if you want to really keep a tree that um, is in this family, mm -hmm. I, I would not be opposed to, to say or to mention that there is an option of macro infusion that has to be delivered by a professional, an arborist, um, but with the caveat that this will have to be applied every 8, 10, 12 months, so it's expensive. Mm -hmm. And um, I will also recommend, of course, to keep the canopy with light, so um, you will prevent from beetles to just inf infest this tree. But if you have one tree and you are not in South Florida, because in South Florida we have the urban setting yeah. mixed with the agriculture, right? So if I have um, avocado in my backyard, 100% it's gonna be infested at some point, right? I have seen yeah. um, you have uh, avocado orchard crossing the road, you have a backyard tree infested and you can see the movement, right? So if you are in Texas and there's no avocado groves around you and there's no forested areas and you have one avocado tree, you're gonna be fine. Just keep it healthy. Um, try not to have other stressors so it's not calling for yeah. beetles. And if you wanna spend some money, you can do the <laughs> macro infusion. But um, I, I don't think those are risk uh, trees under risk. Actually. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And just to you know, kind of like wrap up, uh, I wanted to ask you, kind of like, what are the next steps, right? You kind of like trying to figure out different methods, different different chemical that are kind of like not really working at this point for for avocado orchards. So, what are the next steps in in research for your your program? Mm -hmm. So, this paper was really closing the chapter of propiconazole. I'm not going to do anything else with propiconazole. And so we have several lines of research. One mm -hmm. is to s keep looking for um, synthetic compounds. So I'm definitely a believer that this disease will need an IPM program, so uh, um, multiple strategies. And mm -hmm. chemicals are always on you know, top 
for commercial producers. So we need a first line of defense, which is a synthetic yeah. fungicide. So we are testing several triazoles with uh, more known silent mobility. Mm -hmm. We have partnered with the IR4 program, which is a federal program for the labeling of products already in the market for specialty crops. Mm -hmm. So they are funding uh, some in vitro assays and then greenhouse. Um, so we have found two compounds that are triazoles that are 10 times more fungicidal than propiconazole. So even if they move as bad as propiconazole, you need less of them to kill the fungus. You're going to be more effective too. So, yeah, exactly. Yeah, so that's a hope. So nice. that's one of the directions. Uh, my student now has finished the replication of the in vitro and is moving into potted plants. Mm -hmm. And then we will narrow down and then do some uh, residue testing on field trees before we go and kill, you know, dozens of trees. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be sure. No, absolutely. Uh, yeah. And then the other line of research is biological controls, uh, not against the beetle. We have an entomologist at the station that is working on the beetle side of the equation. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to kill the fungus because if you don't have nutrients for the beetle, there is no beetle, right? Yeah. And actually the fungus is the one that causes the disease. So I'm looking into trichoderma uh, fungus, which is a good fungus, and it can live as an endophyte. So I'm recovering trichoderma that are endophytes from avocado surviving okay. trees and then test them in vitro, and then I'm gonna reintroduce them in seedlings to see if they can colonize the, the plant. And so that's promising, but a more of a long-term, uh, because yeah. it's a living organism, so it takes a while to, yeah, absolutely. to make absolutely. it work. Um, and then we are doing some germplasm screening. So uh, very unlikely that we find resistance because the whole genus is susceptible. Yeah. However, more weird things have happened, right? And it only takes one, right? And so yeah. either that we can use as a rootstock to prevent the spread through the root grafts, mm -hmm. or that it could be a good commercial variety. So we partner with the largest avocado germplasm collection in Mexico, and they are sending us seeds. Now seeds, you know, this is a cross-pollinated species, but uh, this is what we have. We cannot go to Mexico and inoculate the fungus. Yeah. Right? So. <laughs> that would be and, a bad idea. <laughs> yeah, that would be a bad idea. And then the other important thing that I'm doing, and I want to highlight this, is I'm trying to find more sensitive detection methods. Not for gotcha. us. I mean, it is present in the 67 counties of Florida. We are kind of mm -hmm. beyond eradication, um, but for others. So I'm trying to find a way that is easy, effective, cheap, that places like Guatemala, Honduras, Mexico can use as a monitoring and surveillance system. Gotcha. So, um, you know, it really this disease consumes a lot of my um, working hours. Um, but yeah, there's there's hope. You know, avocado is such an important crop worldwide. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah not, only, not only Florida, but many other places, and particularly, you know, Central America, and you go into South America as well. Uh, La Rezia is one of the most abundant uh, exactly. tree, tree groups uh, in the continent. So exactly. absolutely relevant to, to figure these kind of things out. Um, and yeah, I'm very excited to, to hear about what those different experiments turn out to be and, and particularly those like injections um, and new chemicals that you guys are looking into. Um, but yeah, thank you very much for, for joining. I really enjoyed the talk. Uh, I think it's uh, pretty cool information and uh, happy to, to, to talk about it. Thank you. And if somebody is listening and wants to collaborate or have questions, you know, uh, you can just Google Trek Laura Wilt um, or UF Trek Laura Wilt and, and you can find a website for Laura Wilt. And then my program has a very strong outreach and extension component. So I'm happy to um, just pass on the information and, and help whoever needs. Yeah, absolutely. I'm going to drop all of those links uh, below in the description of the of the video and the episode as well. So um, absolutely. Thank you very much for joining cool. today. Yeah, nice to see you.